Hi everyone! I am Clarice Ann Estorninos Cahucom, faculty of the Atenea Law School, where I teach children's rights. I believe the children are the future. Almost everyone knows this famous first line of Whitney Houston's famous song, Greatest Love of All. While this may be true, what we adults often forget our children are also the present. And if we get stuck just seeing them as the future, we may forget that they are present today, they have rights like all of us today, and these rights need to be respected, protected, and fulfilled, not in the future, but today. Thank you for joining me in today's lecture entitled, Children's Rights, Treating Children as Rights Holders. We will first begin at the beginning of children's rights and proceed to answer the question, what does it mean to look at children as rights holders? What are children's rights and where did they first originate? As early as 1870 BC, the well-known Codex Hammurabi, often known as the first legal document, had a rule which stated, If a man wishes to put his son out of his house, and declare before the judge, I want to put my son out. Then, the judge shall examine into his reasons. If the son is guilty of no great fault, for which he can be rightfully put out, the father shall not put him out. Later on, around 529 AD, there was Roman law scripture which declared, in Latin, Ius vitae ac necis and I apologize if I did not pronounce that right, but basically it meant the right of life and death, and they saw the child as a property of the parents. Another scripture line said, Infants is qui far non protest, which meant children below the age of seven were considered to be infants and were considered not to be able to speak. So as early as then, children were seen as almost objects, with no voice or choice of their own, as mere beneficiaries or adults in waiting. Then, fast forward to the Industrial Revolution, many children as young as 7, 8, or 9 were seen working in factories of tobacco or textile, their little hands nimble enough to get the job done. They were cheap, sometimes even free, if his or her parents had debt and an easy source of labor. Children were still generally seen as objects with no voice or choice of their own. Then World War I happened, which had devastating effects on everyone, especially and including the children. Many children were oft orphaned, hurt, abandoned, or worse, killed. This prompted a woman named Englantine Yeb in May 1919 to establish Save the Children Foundation in Great Britain for the purpose of providing the victims of the war, particularly the children, with all necessary relief for their suffering. She felt that her efforts should be supported by a strong statement and together with others, drafted a five-point declaration in 1923. The declaration was submitted to the then General Assembly of the then existing League of Nations and was unanimously adopted by its 49 member states on the 24th of September 1924. This came to be known as the Declaration of Geneva, which said, First, the child must be given the means requisite for its normal development, both materially and spiritually. Second, the child that is hungry must be fed. The child that is sick must be nursed. The child that is backward must be helped. The delinquent child must be reclaimed. And the orphan and the waif must be sheltered and succored. Third, the child must be the first to receive relief in times of distress. Fourth, the child must be put in a position to earn a livelihood and must be protected against every form of exploitation. And fifth, the child must be brought up in the consciousness that its talents must be devoted to the service of its fellow men. 
This declaration was great in the sense that it started the universal codification of children's rights. But if you look closely at the wording, it still treats children as mere beneficiaries waiting to be fed, waiting to be nursed, helped, given his or her needs and relief. Notice, it also refers to the child as it. Again, children were still generally seen as objects with no voice or choice of their own. This 1924 Declaration of Geneva eventually became the 1959 Declaration on the Rights of the Child, which was adopted by the states of the United Nations. And this document had more rights-like language worded in 10 principles. For example, Principle 1 states, The child shall enjoy all the rights set forth in this declaration. Every child, without any exception whatsoever, shall be entitled to these rights without distinction or discrimination on account of race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status, whether of himself or his family. But what was missing with these two declarations? In international law, declarations are non-binding, meaning there is no real legal obligation for states who sign it to follow. A convention, however, is legally binding. Fortunately, after a long drafting process, in 1989, the Convention on the Rights of the Child came to be. And it is one of the most widely ratified conventions to date, with only one country not having ratified it, the United States of America. 1989. Note, however, that before then, in 1948, there was the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And in 1976, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights came into force. These covenants are legally binding documents applied to all persons. And children are persons. So why was there a need for a separate document on children's rights? Aren't children part of all persons in these covenants? In the two covenants recently mentioned, the position of children were limited to just care and protection. Remember how children were seen? As objects without voice or choice? As mere beneficiaries waiting for adults to act and speak for them? Well, that's exactly what the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child did. It reinforced that children are rights holders. It obliged states to take children more seriously as rights holders and allow the introduction of innovations specifically relevant to children. And what are these innovations? First, you have the best interest of the child as a primary consideration found in Article 3. Second, you have the right to preserve identity found in Article 8. You also have, in Article 12, the right to express views or the right to participation. Another is the right to protection from narcotic and psychotropic substances in Article 33. Another is the right to recovery and social reintegration in Article 39. Also, rights in the process of juvenile justice in Article 40. And also improvements were also achieved in the area of health, requiring measures to abolish harmful practices in Article 24. Also, in the realm of education, it introduced the rule that discipline should be administered in a manner consistent with the child's human dignity. And there were many others, many innovations that the CRC introduced. The CRC also importantly introduced a rights-based approach from a needs-based approach when it came to children. And why is this important? In a needs-based approach, needs are not universal. What a child needs in country A may be different from what a child needs in country B. In a rights-based approach, rights are universal regardless of sex, color, gender, race, identity, expression, 
language, religion, political or other opinion, national, ethnic, or social origin, property, disability, birth of oneself, or of that of one's parents. In a needs-based approach, there are no obligations for states to follow. In a rights-based approach, it involves rights which states and other stakeholders must respect, promote, and fulfill, and therefore follow. Professor Samantha Besson, in her article, The Principle of Non-Discrimination in the CRC, found in the International Journal of Children's Rights, explained it well. Children are beings and not just becomings. I love that. Children are beings and not becomings. Children are the future, but also the present. Children have rights, and they have rights that must be respected, promoted, and fulfilled yesterday, today, and in all tomorrows. I end now with this video from Consuelo Zobel Alger Foundation on how children's rights are in the context of the Philippines. Beginning with who is a child and continuing to what children's rights are. Enjoy! Ang itid kong kanta ay para ang bata ay iyong makilala. Sino, sino, sino ba ang bata? Sino, sino, sino ba ang bata? May edad na mas mababa sa labing walong taon. Kaming mga bata, kami nararapat pahalin alagkaan at kinakalinga. May mga bata ring labing walong taon o higit pa, hindi kayang alagaan ang sarili. Laban sa abuso at pananamantala Dahil sa kondisyong pisikal o pag-iisip Ang bawat batay may karapatan Karapatang mabuhay at maproteksyonan Karapatan mo ring umunlad at makilahok sa pamayanan Ako'y may karapatang mabuhay Magkapangalan at bansa na tunay dapat alagaan at maging malaya Maging pati ng pamilyang kumakalinga Na may tirahan at sapat na pagkain Malayo sa sakit at malinis ang paligid Ako'y may karapatang umanlan Nararapat akong magkapag-aral Aking Ito'y dapat mabigyan din ang matutunan ang kultura at mabuting asal. Hayaang maglaro kasama ang mga kaibigan at maglibang sa parke sa ilalim ng araw. Ako'y may karapatang maproteksyonan, iwasan ang mga lugar na may karahasan. Malayo sa panganib at dapat ipaglaban Tumira sa lugar na payapa at ligtas Sa tahimik at matalunin na pamayanan At syempre pagtanggol ng pamahalaan Ako'y may karapatang makilahok Makisali sa disisyong sa aking may epekto Makayag ng sariling pananaw Bumuo ng samahang pangkabataan Magsama-sama ng mapayapa Lumahok sa advocacy ang kailangang bigyan ng linaw Katumbas ng karapatay mga tungkulin na dapat nating gampanan Responsibilidad sa ating mga karapatan ang dapat nating malaman Mag-aral ng mabuti, alagaan ng sarili Kumain ng tama, sumunod sa magulang Ayusin ang paghayag sa opinyon ng may paggalang Tiyak ikay pakikinggan Nang nakakatanda